Well, what a great year we've had, guys. That's pretty fun to think about. I almost said 2016 was such a great year. That's bad. 2017 was such a great year. It's just amazing when we look back to think about all that God has done. And sometimes I forget all the different things that God used you to do here at this church. I mean, that's just pretty fun and exciting to think we got to be a part of it. And um, as we step into 2018, um, we're in the second week of our series, This Is My Year. And uh, this series is all about inviting God to be a part of this year. And I think that's a pretty wise thing to do, considering that God literally created time itself to invite God into the time that he made. Uh, that's a smart thing. That's a wise thing. That's what I want this message to be about. And I just want to start by talking about a major controversy for some of you. Some of you are like, I don't care. Um, But there are some of you, this has been a really big deal this week, okay? For years, if you're an iPhone user, um, you've had a great iPhone experience right up until you update your operating system one time. You'll update your operating system, and then all at once, your phone, which yesterday was working great, the next day is now working terribly. And uh, for years, there have been quote-unquote conspiracy theorists who have said, Apple is intentionally slow down our phones. I was one of those people. I said, I know it. I know it. My phone worked great yesterday. Today, it's terrible. They're doing it on purpose. This has happened to me many times. I'm like, Apple, Apple is terrible. Why do they do this to us? And Apple's like, no, we don't. It's just all in your imagination. If your phone's running slow, it's probably because you need a new iPhone. Then this happened, right? Apple apologizes for iPhone slowdown because they got caught red-handed. I want you to know you're not imagining it. Apple is actually doing this on purpose. There was technical proof this last, well, two weeks ago, two weeks ago that Apple has been doing this. And I actually fell victim to this, okay? I personally fell victim to this. I had an iPhone 5S. It was working great. And then I updated to like iOS 10. And all of a sudden, it was slower than molasses. And I was like, no, why? Why is this happening? Why did I update? It's because you kept badgering me. No later, no later, no later. Okay, fine. Right? That's what we all do. And so I updated my iPhone and it was so bad. I called Apple tech support and they said, you probably just need a new iPhone, right? Really what I needed was a new battery. But uh, I sold the iPhone to a nice lady in our church. She can upgrade the battery and you'll be fine with your phone. And I had to pay for a whole new iPhone 7. I was mad. I was mad. Maybe you're mad too about it. But uh, then I just started thinking about when the first iPhone came out. Do you remember that? And do you remember when the first iPhone came out, 2007? It was spring of my senior year in college. And at first it was laughable. I was like, huh, who's going to pay that much for an iPhone? Steve Jobs is nuts. And then, and then I saw the first iPhone commercial. I still vividly remember where I was sitting in my, not dorm room, but in my apartment senior year of, of college when I saw the first ads for an iPhone. And I was like, that's Really? And so I actually want you to see the video. Check out this video. See if you remember this. See if this jogs any memories. This is how you turn it on. This is your music. This is your email. This is the web. And this is a call on your iPhone. Say you're watching Pirates of the Caribbean. Hmm, did somebody say calamari? The closest would be... Ah. So, I remember watching that and thinking, no way, the future has arrived. I remember thinking, has Jesus returned? Like, is this, this is unbelievable. I can't believe that this is happening right now, right? This is amazing. This is amazing grace, right? I was, my mind, head blown, right? Can't believe that this is a thing. And uh, I don't know, it was like a miracle, I have something that's cooler than what Captain Kirk has. You know what I mean? Like, in Star Trek, like, my life is cooler than Captain Kirk's life. I remember the first time I held an iPhone. I don't know if you remember it. I borrowed one from a friend, and uh, I was like, I got to check this out. And I was using it, and I was like, it's as good as they said it was. Like, this is really, it really is the internet in your hand. I mean, it caused crowd problems. Adults and kids alike would just crowd around. You remember that first person in your life who got an iPhone, you know, because they were like techno savvy and also rich, and everybody just came around them and was like, whoa, 
know, right? Apple gave the world a miracle, a gift, 10 years ago. And I think most of us, when we use it, the thought that went through our mind was, this is miraculous, right? This is amazing. This is just mind-blowing. This will change the world. And it has changed the world. You know what's funny? Is 10 years later today, nobody cares. Nobody cares, right? I mean, Steve Jobs is terrible. Like, what's wrong with him? This is the worst. They slow down my phone on purpose. Apple is the devil. I can't believe that they do that, right? Steve Jobs, I have to wait one or one and a half seconds to make a phone call. This is unbearable. It's amazing to think that without Apple, um, most futurists would say that today, 10 years after the original iPhone came out, we might just be reaching the capability of the first iPhone. I want you to think about that. Some futurists say that we may not even yet be reaching the capability of the very first iPhone. And to me, that is just mind-blowing. It's amazing to think that. And today, we literally look at something that was a miracle 10 years ago, and we hate it, right? We look at something that was a miracle 10 years ago, and we're like, what's wrong with Steve Jobs? I can't believe that he would be such a jerk. How could, you know, and he's gone, but what's wrong with his company, Tim Cook? How could he do that to me, right? And I'm like, man, do you guys remember what it was like? Do you remember using MapQuest? Oh, that was the worst, right? You just had to put in your directions, you'd print it out, and then you'd reset your odometer every time. Remember doing that? My dad always said, John, if you reach through the steering wheel, you're not going to be able to turn. You have to reach around your steering wheel. But I always, when he wasn't around, was a rebel. I just reached straight through that steering wheel to reset the odometer. And if you missed your turn on MapQuest, you were just lost. I remember getting into people's cars, and there was like hundreds of MapQuest papers just everywhere, right? Remember that? The MapQuest garbage that we had to deal with filling up landfills? You'd miss out. When the iPhone came out and all that happened, I mean, people literally called the iPhone, I'm not trying to be irreverent here, but people called the iPhone the Jesus phone, right? I mean, it was, it was, um, it was, it was amazing. I don't think it's wrong to be angry at Apple, but I, I'm a little upset at Apple for what they did. But I want to put what they did in perspective of the original miracle. And I know that our phones are sometimes slow and laggy. I know that it's frustrating to have to wait one or even one and a half seconds to make a phone call. Like, oh, that's the worst, Right? But, but seriously, imagine life without it just for a moment. I mean, I just think about the context because that changes the lag in the moment, doesn't it? And the reason why I'm talking about this is I think there's a lot of us who treat Jesus like an old iPhone, right? I mean, when you first get Jesus in your life, it's like, this is amazing grace. Life is amazing. Shine FM. I love it. It's all I listen to. This is awesome. Elevation worship. It's all my favorite. I love it. I love it. Life is so good. My life is new. I love God so much. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to be everywhere, you know. But then as time goes on, we sort of just get used to the miracle, don't we? I mean, it's not like the iPhone changed. We still have the exact same iPhone, right? I mean, even our slow, laggy iPhones today are better than the original iPhone 1, Right? But what's happened is we've just grown used to the convenience of having Jesus and his promises in our life. And then what happens is we hit what I call a little bit of Jesus lag, right? A little bit of lag in God's provision. It's like, God, I have been praying to meet the one for three months. Three months, God. What am I supposed to do? This is horrible, right? Why aren't you providing? Where are you? Hello, right? We get frustrated with the lag. I just think that we should always make decisions in the moment in light of God's provision in the past and future, right? We should do a sermon series called Choices where we talk about that. That would be brilliant. Already done. The problem is, I think a lot of us miss out on the miracles of life when we fail to remember the context of God's provision in our past. I have a lot of people ask me, why doesn't God do miracles today? Why don't I see miracles in my life today? And I would tell you, God does do miracles every day all around you. It's just you've grown used to them. Let's just think about the provision of Jesus in our life for a moment, right? Most historians would agree that the teachings of Jesus inspired the Enlightenment. Almost all historians would agree that the Enlightenment would not have happened when it happened and probably would have never happened had it not been for one man, Jesus of Nazareth. That's kind of a big deal because what happened because of the Enlightenment? The scientific method was invented, right? So now, without Jesus, we wouldn't have the Enlightenment. I mean, that's a big deal to think about, right? We wouldn't have the Enlightenment, we wouldn't have the scientific method, and we wouldn't have the Industrial Revolution. So literally everything in your life that came from that process was literally the direct result of the Enlightenment, like in the teachings of Jesus. That's mind-blowing to me. That's a really, really big deal. Like I think about that and my head is just blown away, right? And I think when we don't remember the context of God's provision, 
We forget about his miracles all around us. I think that's what New Year's is all about. We remember and celebrate the miraculous work of God in our past as we make decisions in the present about our future. As we walk into this new year, I want to step into our future, taking an opportunity to remember God's provision in our past. And uh, we've had a pretty amazing run here as a church. Um, And I'll just tell you, if you're new with us, this is a little bit of a different message than I normally give on the weekend. Next week, I'll have a very goal-driven or a very purpose-driven message for you and your life. But this week, I want to take some time to talk about goals. That's what I want to do. I want to take some time to talk a little bit about goals. And uh, I love serving you guys as your pastor. One of my favorite parts, though, about serving is uh, getting to work with the leadership team, the elders and deacons who are my boss, and then work with our volunteer staff and our staff team. And uh, my favorite part of the week is Mondays, which is technically the end of our week. We get together on Mondays to um, talk about what went wrong in service, right? And uh, then we celebrate the wins, what God did over the last week. And uh, we have some of the most dedicating, dedicated and God-fearing people I know on our staff team. And uh, when we celebrate the wins, it just blows my mind what God does in one week. God restores marriages. People choose to follow Jesus as their leader and forgiver. Um, God is healing and restoring people's lives physically. Like, that's something that we've seen here a whole bunch this last year. And that kind of blows my mind. Like, people who have had lifelong struggles with clinical anxiety and depression. And just the name of Jesus has set them free from that. That blows my mind. I'm not saying always. I'm not saying God always does this. But we've seen this dozens of times. That blows my mind. That's a really cool thing. Something that pills can't do, something that people have battled with for their lifetime and Jesus sets them free. That's awesome. It's great because God does a lot each week. And I think that if you're like me, a lot of times I go to sleep at night wondering what God did today, right? I fall asleep and I'm like, God, I worked all day long, you know, worked hard. What did you even do with my life today? Like, this is just whatever, okay? I'm getting angry at God's leg in my life. And I'm like, God, I'm waiting on you. But at the end of each week, after focusing on a specific goal or idea, it's amazing to zoom out and look at the last seven days and see all that God did. I feel like a lot of us fall asleep at night wondering what God did and where he was. But at the end of the week, when we look at God's provision over the course of the week, it's like, wow, God did a whole lot. His hand was on us all week. That's really amazing. It's amazing how focused on the short term I get. I think a lot of times I just focus on the short term as a person, and that's a big problem, right? Because a lot of times when we focus on the short term, we don't see what God is doing in the long term. Sometimes I get frustrated because I feel like I'm just circling the same issue in my life, right? And I'm like, God, why am I dealing with this issue? You know, I mean, I feel like I shouldn't have to be dealing with this issue still. I've been dealing with this issue for years. But when I zoom out, I realize, man, I am dealing with the same issue, but I'm dealing at it at a whole new level, right? I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. And that's because of God's provision. Now, This week, I reviewed the staff. We did their annual performance reviews. And uh, they review me as well, just so you know. It's not like I get a free free go at it. Uh, They talk to me as well about ways I can lead them better. But I was blown away by what God did over the last year. When I looked at that video, I was blown away by what God did at our church over the last year. And uh, each year, additionally, I sort of review the church with a letter that I write to you guys. Okay? I write a letter to the church. You're going to be getting those letters this week. I'll be sending them to you in the mail. If you're an owner, if you're not an owner, you should sign up for a Next Step class. That's one of the benefits of being an owner. It's really cool. You can fill out a Next Step card, drop it off at the welcome desk after this service. But it's fun to actually look back and see God's faithfulness right? Um, These are the actual letters that I've written to you over the past several years. This is a letter from 2014. Look, our family, we only have two kids. That was nice, okay? 2015, 2016, three kids. That must have been nice, right? It's just cool to see the way that God provides. You know what's amazing? In all these letters, I review last year's goals, and then we look at new goals that we're setting for the next year. And what blows my mind is in every letter, God has answered almost all of our prayers exactly as we prayed them. Like, that blows my mind. Because these are not small goals. These are what I call big, hairy, audacious goals. These are scary goals that I don't think we really can hit as a church without the provision of God. It just blows my mind to see what God does. And I want to take a moment to review last year's letter. Now, in last year's letter, we prayed specifically that God would let us reach 1,000 people a weekend by the end of September 2017. And I'm going to be honest, we didn't hit that goal until November Okay, we didn't hit that goal until November of this year, but uh, in December of this year, this is the picture, by the way, where we rolled that out, and you know, it was a really big deal, and it was scary, but uh, last year in December, we had 669 people in church, um, average across the five or four weekends of December. This year, across the five weekends of December, we had 1,122 people in church, average. Isn't that cool? That's pretty cool to think that we pray about that, and that's what God does. Now, people ask me all the time, John, why do you care so much? about numbers. 
Why are numbers such a big deal to you? First off, I actually don't care that much about numbers. I probably should care more because God cared a lot about numbers. He put a whole book in the Bible called Numbers, after all. But every time people gather, every time they come together, God always takes the time to record the specific number of people that were there. That's a big deal to him. You'll see that consistently across the Old and New Testament, right? I know lots of people who are churches, pastors, who have criticized me about counting. And I'm like, man, I'm just being biblical. Because the Bible's my authority, God calls us to do this, right? And numbers are just one measure of the move of God. But I don't think that's everything. But uh, I care about numbers specifically because every single number has a name and every name has a story that matters to God. And I want to show you specifically about one number that's had a big impact on my life. This is a picture of me at my desk and above my desk, there's a hat right here, okay? And that hat actually belonged to my grandfather. This is the hat right here. I brought it in. I took it down and I brought it in for you guys to see. But this hat is a big deal to me. I've shared about it before, but my grandfather was a really big deal in my personal life. He was one of just somebody who really dignified me when I was a boy, but he made me feel like I was a man. And uh, he fought in World War II. He was raised in the Great Depression. He did a lot of good things for the Twin Cities. I mean, he built United Children's Hospital, which is a hospital that would later save my life. That's a cool part of his legacy, right? He built this hospital, and then his grandson would have surgery that could only be done there that would save his life. Um, Back, this is crazy, in the 90s, he was a huge voice for assault on women. He started a battered women's shelter called the Doris and Stan Hill Home. And uh, it's just cool to think about how my grandfather was this visionary voice for something um, for women who at that time, I mean, you couldn't talk about assault. They'd be like, I laugh you out of the office. And my grandfather said, no, I care about women, right? He was just a really, really big deal. Now, my grandfather was raised in church and um, he left the church. And uh, in conversations with him, there are a lot of different reasons. But I think one of the biggest reasons is as an academic, educated, questioning, curious person, he would ask questions in church and they'd be like, don't ask, just have faith. And uh, that's not a legitimate answer for a man who has questions and is a critical thinker. And the last thing he said to me before he died on Christmas Day of 2005 was, John, my only regret is that when I leave this life, you think that because I don't follow Jesus as my leader and forgiver, that means when I die, I'm going to go to hell. And I know that's going to break your heart when I die. And my grandfather passed away Christmas Day 2005, and I believe he is spending an eternity separated from God. And uh, for a man that I love so much, after I really got serious about my faith, I swore that one day I would build a church where somebody like him, somebody who was inquisitive, somebody who was smart and engaged, could learn about the the love of Jesus and the evidence of Jesus and have real faith in Jesus. You see, Jesus doesn't look at you and say, you need to have blind faith. Jesus never said, have blind faith, just believe. What did Jesus do? He gave signs, wonders, and miracles, okay? Translated today is evidence. I want you to know that to follow Jesus, it doesn't require blind faith. It does require faith, but faith is not blind, blind Okay? Faith can be built on real evidence. And I believe that even today we see signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus is who he says he is. I am not a follower of Christ because I have blind faith. I'm a follower of Christ because I don't have enough faith to follow any other world religion. I look at it, I'm like, man, the case for Jesus is really good. And the case for all other thought processes, especially atheism, right? I just don't have enough faith to do that. Something can't come from nothing. I became a follower of Jesus. I want you to know we set goals because every number has a name, and a story. There was a number in my life that I was not able to reach. God didn't use me to reach my grandfather. God didn't call him. And that breaks my heart. But I know that there are 20,000 people within driving distance of this church, within a 10-mile radius of this church, that do not presently follow Jesus. And every single one of them, I might not know them, but every single one of them matters to somebody. Every one of them has a name and a story that matters to God. I can't reach my grandfather, but maybe we could reach yours. Maybe we could reach your grandson and your granddaughter. Maybe we could reach your husband or your wife, right? That's what God calls us to do. And I look at the 1,000 people that we are reaching right now as a church, and I think that's a small goal. I mean, biblically speaking, that's a relatively small-sized church, right? Biblical churches, we're all 15 or 20,000, right? So we're really just kind of small. We have a small goal here. We do this because we care about individuals. It's not a big deal. It's a small goal to meet a big need. And uh, our other church goals were really crushed. I'm really grateful for it. Um, This is a screenshot of the letter I sent to you guys last year. Our kids' ministry was supposed to hit 160. We're regularly over 200. Our youth group was supposed to be over 100. Our last meeting, we had 127 people present. And that's actually a really big deal because our youth ministry was actually really struggling all last year. We just were really struggling to gain momentum. And I'm just so proud of Zachary for coming in. God has just used him to breathe new life into next gen, which starts this Wednesday night. Hey, you should come, okay? 
But listen, if you don't follow Jesus, one of the biggest objections that I had to following him was I was like, man, if Christians really believe what they say they do, if they believe that Jesus is the only way, why don't they take it a little bit more seriously? right? Why aren't they a little bit more passionate about it? I love being a part of First Church because here I see a church where people are passionate about reaching people with the message of Jesus. That's a really cool thing to see, right? I want us to continue to do that. Now, God is good, and uh, each year at our church, we've seen God do some really great things. We've seen God's hand really bless and minister at our church. Um, In the last three and a half years, we've grown from, in August, 200 people a weekend to now 1,100 people a weekend. That's pretty cool to see when you think about it, but seeing the actual stories is a real blessing. Nothing has been more meaningful than seeing God transform marriages, God transform lives, God transform drug addictions. I love remembering what God has done. I think it's easy to think that this stuff is normal. Like in the moment, at the beginning, it seemed like a miracle, didn't it? It's like, oh, we've been waiting for years. You know, this church tried for years before Krista and I got here and began the transition from what it was to what it is today, right? But it had been trying for years, and and suddenly we started winning. Things started, and it was amazing. It's a miracle. But what happens over the course of time when you're living with a miracle, in a miracle, doesn't it start to seem like commonplace, right? And all of a sudden, we just treat it like it's normal. I want you to know this isn't normal. People don't normally get free from oxy addictions. Marriages that have filed for divorce don't regularly turn around. People with anger and depression and anxiety don't normally get healed. People with lifelong bitterness don't normally let it go. And people far from God don't normally get filled with life and optimism and hope in Christ. But these miraculous things have been normal at First Church, and I think it's because we've been lifting up the name of Jesus, right? We serve the God who laid the foundations of the world and who created us. I just think that there's some of us here today who are like iPhone users, it's frustrating, just getting, you know, kind of bored of it. You know, it's just kind of, you know, whatever. I mean, it is what it is. Isn't this the way it always is? No, no. I just looked. We would be in the top 100 fastest growing churches in the country. There's only maybe, maybe like 60 other churches in the country that are experiencing what we are experiencing. I'm grateful to be a part of it. And as we come into another year, I have to admit, and I've been sharing with the church just my personal struggle over the last several sermons, but I was drifting. I was drifting right? We come into the year, and I was like an iPhone user. I was like, well, you know, this is, I guess this is what it is. You know, I'm expecting, you know, I just believe I'm entitled to be a part of this. And um, I've always been driven by goals. I was penning my letter to the church thinking what we we're going to do this year. I just kind of, for the first time, there wasn't like that drive there. So I was calculating based on current growth trends, Based on geography and population densities, based on a consultant's best practice, what would be a good goal? Based on building capacity. I was debating between, you know, 1,200, 1,300 next year. I don't know. I don't want to be unrealistic, you know? I mean, what is possible and probable in light of current trends? And all at once, I'm like, John, do you hear yourself thinking? Like, do you believe that a supernatural God exists? Or do you live like it's only what's possible in the natural I mean, do you believe that God's spirit guides and fills and blesses and leads and supernaturally can fill a church if it's God's will? Do you believe that that's possible? And I was like, man, I'm not acting like it. Not acting like it. That was the dire reality I was in. Peter preached at the very first church meeting. And uh, that's part of what I love about our church's name, right? We're called First Church. And it's not just because we were one of the first churches in this area. It's actually because we were part of the very, um, we're part of the very first church meeting. That's what we want to model ourselves after. We don't want to model ourselves after a church from 100 or 200 or 1,000 years ago. We want to model ourselves after the very first church that Jesus started and Peter led, right? That's what we want to be a part of. And I just want to read to you from a passage, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. I want to read to you from this passage where Peter is um, giving the very first invitation to receive Christ at the very end of the very first church meeting. And uh, it's kind of a cool experience because this is what we really model ourselves after. Check this out. This is Peter preaching to this huge crowd. And by the way, we know there was at least 3,000 people present, probably more like nine or 10,000 people, right? So again, um, people sometimes they say, oh, I don't like mega churches. What you're saying is you don't like the Bible, right? So anyway, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter, and that's always a goal that we have, right? We want the word of Jesus to cut into our hearts. We want to feel it, right? Okay, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what Peter does is he gives an invitation to receive Christ right here. Okay, this is why we regularly do it, you know, that thing like with heads bowed and eyes closed, moment of privacy and concentration at the end of our service. You know why we do that? Because Peter did it. 
That's why we do it, because it's rooted in Scripture, right? This is a biblical practice, okay? And then he said, the promise is for you and for your children. Why do we say generation after generation? Because God had a generational heart when he founded his church. I want you to know, you're 15, 16 years old. This church isn't just about you. We are preparing to reach your unborn children. We're preparing to reach the next generation. I always love that focus. I mean, Peter immediately says that church isn't just about you, it's about the next generation. And then he says, and all who are far off, right? All who are far off, people far from God. That's why at First Church we say that you can be a part of this family even before you believe. You don't have to have a strong faith. You don't even have to have a faith to be a part of this community, to be loved and and accepted here, right? That's a pretty cool thing. I love that. And that's not because, you know, no one's perfect, everyone's welcome. We don't say that because we think it's trendy. We say that because, man, that was God's heart for the original church, for the first church. That's what we model model ourselves after, right? And then Paul gives his big invitation with many other words. By the way, we know that Peter and Paul would occasionally preach all night. So if you guys think that my sermon is long, just stop complaining, y'all. You don't even know. Okay, with many other words he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, just a couple things to note. First off, I love the not delaying, right? They gave their lives to Christ, and they were immediately baptized. They did not wait. I know some of you, you've given your life to Christ like months ago, and you come here every single week, and you're like, I really should take a next step. Maybe next time I come, right? Right? That's what happens. No, no, no. They don't delay. They literally, they, they believe and they're baptized immediately. I'm challenging you. I really mean this. Would you take a next step? If you really believe that Jesus is the son of God, would you take a next step? Would you take a next step, please? Secondly, my point is like 3,000 though, guys. Like, wow, that's a, that's a big deal. That's a lot of people in a day. I mean, we've seen maybe 1,000 in three years, not even. They saw 3,000 in a day. And as I was reading this this week, I just got a little sick to my stomach. I'm going to be honest, I'm making these goals to the church, I'm asking myself based on trends and capacity and realistic expectation. And then I just started asking myself, John, do you really believe that the God of the New Testament is real and alive and working among us? Or do you believe that that's just a closed dispensation that's over? Do I really believe that God can do great things? Do I really believe that God can move on our behalf? And I want to make it clear, nobody ever believed that we should just Pray and not do anything and watch God work. That's not right. That's not, that's not a biblical thing. What God does is he takes our very best, though it may be little, and he multiplies it. Right? That's what God does. He wants to take our very best, though it may be little, and he multiplies it. I want to give God our best, even if it's little. And I want to ask him to do great things. Jesus tells us in John 14, 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works. I want to see greater things here. I mean, do we believe that that's true, that that we can do greater things than Jesus did? We've had a great run. For the 20% of us, that's one out of five, one out of five of us who are here um, for the last three and a half years, it's been miraculous, right? God multiplied the best that you had. God did great things in you and through you. From that 20%, God raised $6 million, right? That's a big deal. And it wasn't all big gifts. There were big gifts. There were medium gifts. There were small gifts. Everybody sacrificed so that we could be here. And it's really cool to look and say, man, look what God did through us. But listen, for the 80% of us who are new in that time, I want you to hear this. You are sitting in their sacrifice, right? Four out of five of us, we're sitting in their sacrifice. And here's my fear. I don't want to look back and have most of us be like, yeah, we missed it. That was the golden era That was the gilded age of the church. That was really the special time. I wish I could have been there. It was great to see how God moved then. You know, back in 2014 and 15 and 16, wow, those were great days. What if God could do it again through you? What if you could be the next 20%? Right? What if we just said, hey, God, I want you to do it again. Even if you were part of the 20%, I don't want us to look back and say, yeah, look what God did through us. We've done our duty. I guess God's work in our life is done. That was God moving greatly on our behalf. You know, we'll just sit back. No. What if we just said, God, could you do it again? Could you move mountains again? Could you transform our church again? Could you multiply us again? Could we see marriages healed again? Our church did what experts call statistically impossible. We went from a traditional mainline denominational church to a thriving, invitational, gospel-centered church. And I was setting goals, and I just started thinking, do you think that God could do it again? Do you think that God could do it again through us or our best days behind us? 
Was that it? Or could God really multiply us? I want today the 1,000 or so that will be a part of these services to be the next 20%. I want God to use us again to restore marriages, to bring healing, and to change eternities. And I don't want to pray for the incremental. I want to ask God for the monumental. I want us to be a part of this. I want to see God use us, use you. I despair at the thought of our lives passing us by without seeing God move greatly on our behalf. At the start of 2017, we prayed audaciously and boldly that we could see 1,000 people a weekend. It was ridiculous. 67% growth in a year was ridiculous. Yet God did it. Why can't we see God do something like that again? And so with the elders and deacons, we've been praying together. With our staff, we've been praying and asking God, God, what could we do? We want to ask. We believe you're a God of extravagance, a God of great things. What could we do as a church? And we've been praying, and we want to start praying for something that we don't really think is possible in our own flesh, not based on current growth trends, but based on a move of the Spirit, the move of God's Spirit. I believe this is possible. We want to start praying for 5,000 people in five years, okay? That's a big goal. I want to be clear, this is not statistically likely. We don't have the building capacity. We don't have the population uh, in the surrounding community. This means if this is going to happen, God's going to have to allow us to to plant churches, to go multi-site, to go in multiple locations. We're going to need at least two other large effective locations. We're probably going to have to go to many more services to do this. But I look at this and I say, man, every name, every story matters to God. It's worth it. I received the gospel of Jesus in my life and I missed him. I missed him, but I want to reach your loved ones. I want us together to transform this community and this county. I don't believe the God of the New Testament is dead. And I know we might not reach this, but I want to live in faith that we can. I want to ask God to do great things through us. I want to live like we really believe the New Testament is real. I want us to believe that we serve the God who moves mountains. And each year, We pick a word as a church that helps bring focus, right, to our ministry. We pick a word, um, thought, or phrase that really helps guide us as a church. And if you remember, in 2014 and 15, our word was pioneer, right? I said, let's stand at the edge of, of the new frontier and let's walk into it. Let's pioneer new things as a church. Let's go there together. It was a powerful and moving word for us at that time, wasn't it? And then in 2016, we picked the word inspire. We wanted to be inspired by God. We wanted to believe that God could use us again. We needed inspiration because in that moment as a church, as we stood at the precipice, I think there were a lot of us who were like, I don't know if we can really make this transition. I don't know if we can really move into this new building. I don't know if God can really do this through us. We needed inspiration from God's spirit, and boy, did he give it to us. In 2017, we prayed for purpose, didn't we? Man, this was a great year. God gave us such an abundant ministry. God was multiplying us. We said, we need to live on the Great Commission as a church because we have so many new followers of Christ. If we don't start getting into our purpose, we are going to see people die on the vine, right? We're praying desperately that God would do great things. Now, in 2018, we've been praying as a staff for a word. It's been a really big deal for us. Um, We've been asking God, seeking God together. Chris and I have been praying diligently about this. And uh, we just decided, and this is going to become a bigger deal throughout the year. Every year it is with the word. I reveal the word, and the room's like, "Uh, okay, whatever. But by the end of the year, it's a big deal. For 2018, our word is passion. That's our word. That's our prayer. That's our cry to the Lord. God, would you give us passion? Would you give us a fire in our hearts that's deeper and stronger than it's ever been? I want you to check out the passion of the early church, as the band does now, this time, at this point, come out. Acts 2.42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, right? Not blind faith, faith based on evidence. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Wow, that's beautiful. Every day, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I want you to think about it. They went to church like every day. Some of you guys are like, I go once or twice a month. It's good, right? They got together every day. I mean, not because they had to, because they wanted to. They had this passion, right? They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I read that, and I just got so excited by the passion they show. It's just so exciting to me to see this generous, giving, loving community. I mean, I read that, and that's what the church is supposed to be. That's what God could allow us to become, right? Don't, get, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to make you go to church every day. But um, that's what we could become, right? 
And I think this community, we've always had duty, haven't we? Got a lot of Dutch people here. We always will do our duty, right? You, you work hard, you save. Boy, boy, do you save, right? You work hard, you save, you gave, you do your duty. If somebody asks, you say, yeah, I'll do it because it's my duty. And listen, when I think about Jesus, when I think about who Jesus is to us, his work on the cross, his spirit being present and alive inside of us, duty is not the word. Duty is not the word that I think aptly describes what God wants for you, right? God is not a duty that you do, okay? God is more. God is a passion. God is a love. God is a relationship. When I look at our last three years, I see these words, right? A pioneering spirit. We're going to pioneer the frontier. We're going to walk into it boldly. I see inspiration from God. I see a purpose-filled life, right? I see these things, and I see them combining three lessons combined into one word, passion, right? This is what passion is. Passion is more than just a feeling. Passion is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, bringing a message powerfully to a new world. Passion is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, Father, is there any other way? If there's not, then I'll do it. I trust you. That's passion. That's what God calls us to do. I want to ask you guys to stand as we get ready to go into a moment of song. But I want us to activate the work of God at a whole new level this year. I want us to shift into the overdrive that God has given us with passionate hearts. I want you to hear Jesus' words again. Jesus says, I tell you, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. I want to believe for greater things this year. Before I've been walking out on the stage recently, I've just been doing a different mental preparation. I've just been asking myself, John, what, is, what if this is the last time you ever get to preach the gospel of Jesus from the stage? Maybe you'll lose the freedom to do it. Maybe you could die while you're preaching. I don't know. What if this is the last time you ever get to bring the gospel of Jesus? I think about it and I think, man, I want to get out there and I want to swing as hard as I can. I don't want to leave anything back. I want to bring the truth of the gospel to this world, to these people that God has entrusted us with, right? I just want our church to be the same way. What if this is our last year together? Before we lose the freedom together? Or before Christ returns? What if this is the last time? What if this is the last year that we have together? I want us to live for it, to crush it, okay? If this is our last at bat before Christ returns and the music ends, I want us to swing as hard as we can. I want to swing for the fences. I don't want to strike out looking. I can't guarantee as a church that we're going to reach that goal. That's a big, audacious goal. But we're going to swing as hard as we can. I want to live with passion. I want to live with love for one another. I want to embody the Word of God as the church, the New Testament Word of God. We're going to live and pour out the love of Jesus on this community. Because if God is for us, who can stand against us? We serve the God who moves mountains, right, church? We saw. We saw God revive a dying church, didn't we? We saw God heal depression and anxiety. We saw God multiply us fivefold. Let's ask Him to do it again. Let's pioneer again. Let's inspire again. Let's live with purpose again. God, give us passion for your word, passion for your love. Make a way where there is no way, God. Would you do it again through us? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we lift up your word, we lift up your gospel, and we lift up your son. Would you give us passion this year? Would you move through us? Would you transform this community, God? We ask that you would multiply us fivefold again. We ask boldly and audaciously.